Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Fred Fisher, President and CEO of one of the largest chapters of the ALS Association. ALS is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, which affects 30,000 people in the United States, causing the wasting away of the nerve cells of the brain and spinal column that control voluntary muscles. Death usually comes within two to five years of diagnosis, and there is no known cure. The ALS Association is dedicated to advancing research leading to the eradication of ALS and to supporting individuals and families living with the disease. Fred has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Fred, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So let's talk a bit about the, the condition, ALS, um, Lou Gehrig's disease and its impact on families and some of the challenges that ALS faces as, peop as researchers try uh, seek a, a, a way to eradicate this condition. Sure. Most everybody's heard of Lou Gehrig, but most people don't know what Lou Gehrig's disease is. Uh, and so we have a challenge and families have a challenge with the general community really understanding the devastating nature of it because nobody saw Lou Gehrig go through his decline. Right. Uh, and so the easiest way to describe it is to say that uh, when you're losing voluntary muscle movements, what that really means is you lose the ability to speak, to swallow, to breathe. Uh, and those are all fundamental to uh, our lives. And so the role of the ALS Association is really to give people their voice back give people their movement back, uh, give them what they need so they can continue to breathe uh, in an assisted way, uh, so that they can continue to live enriching lives. And in general, given the very rapid pro progression of the disease for the vast preponderance of, of people who, who live with ALS, it's a uh, very rapid progression from being mobile to having mobility uh, severely restricted, and that happens very, very quickly, to, um, to then requiring uh, very substantial amounts of care with a lot of technology to support that. That's right. And one of our objectives is to really speed the time to diagnosis uh, because the decline is so rapid, um, but it's a challenge because ALS is a rule-out diagnosis. So sometimes ALS gets confused with a stroke or some other neurodegenerative disease. Um, and so by the time a person actually gets diagnosed, their neurologist has ruled out anything else. And that can take a year or longer. Uh, people will recall back to a trip or a fall or their slurred speech or they'll choke. And those are really the earliest signs of the disease. But it's not until the disease really progresses that neurologists can rule out everything else. And so what we try to do is create enormous within, uh, awareness within the neurological community to recognize those symptoms as quickly as possible and connect people to the organization, which can then give them the resources they need, give them the education they need, so that we don't learn about them in the middle of a crisis. And, and part of the, the challenge is sustaining awareness, because although there are 30,000 people who live with ALS, the reason for that is that so many people who are diagnosed um, are, are gone within a very short period of time. Right. The uh, people are more familiar with diseases like MS right. and Parkinson's, which have essentially the same incidence rate as uh, ALS. Uh, the problem is, is that we don't get this critical mass of patients because with MS and Parkinson's, you live a lot longer. Right. With ALS, some people die within six months of diagnosis, although we also have outliers, people living 10, 15 years mm -hmm. with the disease. And what research shows us is that right now, the best way that we can help people live longer with ALS is providing them with robust, uh, intensive, multidisciplinary care. It can help them live three times longer than the only drug approved by the FDA. So that's why getting people in so quickly, getting them diagnosed so quickly, and getting them care quickly uh, is so important because it literally uh, is the only thing that can help them live longer, meaningful lives. 
we have this, this uh, question of, of diagnosis through elimination. Um, how is the ALS looking at that problem and working with neurologists to increase the speed of diagnosis? Is it a matter of simple education or are new techniques being developed in, in, and, and is, is that development being funded through the ALS Association? For us, what's important is awareness. Because of the relative uh, low incidence of ALS, many neurologists will see only a handful of ALS patients in their entire career. So our objective is to create these centers for ALS care, which in essence become magnets to the patient community and the medical community, where if a doctor has a suspicion they're having trouble identifying the cause of a neurological disorder, they can be aware of this fabulous center in their community that is trained to recognize the early signs. Uh, so for us, it's building an infrastructure in the medical community that's trained to support ALS patients and at the same time be known within the medical community so that doctors have a place to go. How does funding work in this, in this environment where medical costs are skyrocketing, insurance costs are perhaps increasing uh, even at a, at a greater pace, and resources are so constrained? Um, how, do, how does that work on a, what is arguably an orphan disease uh, where there is uh, very little, dare I say it, profit attached to the treatment of these diseases? Yeah. ALS is definitely not a profit center for any medical institution. Uh, the way that we impact that is through research, where if you combine research, uh, clinical research, with patient care, then you're creating another income stream for the hospital or clinic. Uh, without that, there are enormous gaps in funding. Um, based on Medicare rules, what's reimbursable, right. what's not, so that the model of care that we developed here in California, uh, which we got written into state law as the standard of care for ALS, has many gaps uh, in terms of what's funded through Medicare. Uh, and so it creates enormous challenges for hospitals and, and uh, a medical institution really has to be committed to the ALS community uh, in order to really get in the game. And is that a commitment engendered through uh, private individuals who, who uh, drive that kind of commitment? Or is it more on the, uh, on the basis of, of, um, of government work, um, advocacy, education? How does that commitment come about? Well, it's uh, a huge challenge for the association because the association has no third party payers. So, uh, and, the, and the medical community looks to us uh, in order to fund those gaps. Mm -hmm. And so our work is largely philanthropic. Uh, we've had some success here in California with some large government grants to subsidize the care and some large private grants. But in essence, those grant efforts uh, are philanthropic. Uh, the irony of ALS is it's a relatively small population it's not the thing that people are going to give to if they don't have someone that they know who's connected to it. So for us, it's the ALS community, in essence, that's supporting that's the ALS community. It's the, themselves, their friends, their companies. So corporate sponsors become very important. Um, but it's also through our, our advocacy efforts, both uh, at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level where we're working to create awareness of the needs of the ALS community, of the gap in funding. And arguably, the research that is involved in deconstructing ALS um, has great application for other conditions. That's what we understand. And my background is not scientific. Uh, so, um, but what I understand from our chief science officer and others is that uh, if we can unlock the mystery of ALS, that will open the door to understanding lots of other neurodegenerative diseases. Now, as a chapter that's connected to um, a, a national organization and working with partner chapters across the United States, um, certainly uh, here in this region, um, what is your uh, relationship with national? What is your relationship with other, um, with other chapters? The chapter's job traditionally 
has been to be on the front lines taking care of patients. Mm -hmm. uh, although we recognized early on that uh, in order to be successful against the disease, uh, our role was really much broader than that. And that as an organization, we needed to embrace the mission and vision of the National ALS Association and take specific steps to advance patient care, advance public policy in support of people with ALS, and advance research uh, in ALS. So uh, in many ways, we are now mirroring uh, the work of the entire association. And as the leading chapter doing that, we provide an example of opportunities for that that other chapters can see, whether it's in state advocacy, local advocacy, organizing the research community, all things that we've been doing here in California, um, there's opportunities for that in every state across the country. And so we've seen ourselves, and our board really sees us, as um, uh, pioneers, really, in advancing the role that chapters can play in battling this disease. Are there mechanisms in place for sharing knowledge and for um, uh, uh, replicating some of your successful approaches in other chapters and for you to do that, um, to do the same uh, for the programs that are developed elsewhere? And one of the challenges of a national organization is how do you set up communication streams that really foster that. Mm -hmm. And so the association relies largely on an informal network, uh, informal relationships among chapter executives. Um, the California executives came together really for the first time uh, two years ago uh, to advance a state advocacy model. Um, and before that, there hadn't been a lot of cooperation. Uh, a lot's happened since then. We've had a lot of success since then. And it's gotten the attention of other chapters. Uh, and we have a national conference, which mm -hmm. is uh, 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 another opportunity for us to get together. Um, but uh, one of the issues that I've really been advocating for uh, recently uh, is for the creation within the association of a council of executives, uh, a formal place where the executives at the chapter level, the exe executives at the national level, have an opportunity to engage each other on policy issues, on mission issues, on program issues, so that we really are sharing best practices and we're also addressing some of the obstacles that we're facing to achieving our goals. So many uh, times when we're, when we're working with national organizations and we're working with chapters and uh, we're, we're interviewing all sides, um, we hear about the tensions between national and uh, the, cha the chapters. Uh, those tensions uh, run along uh, differences of opinion in terms of program, emphasis, funding, and certainly fundraising um, is, uh, it ca can, be a, can be a fault line. Um, where are the areas of tension in this, creative tension uh, in this relationship from your perspective? Well, that's the uh, $50 million question. Um, uh, the biggest uh, challenge that we face uh, in the ALS community is that it, it matters where the check goes. Uh, it matters whether a donor writes their check out to our chapter or to the National Association. And as an association, we have made an effort to brand ourselves as one organization, as one entity, when in fact we're 40 different entities with 40 different boards, 40 different budgets, and so there's enormous tension around revenue, not just in times like we've been through uh, in the past couple of years, but at all times, because there's tension in terms of the programs that we need to implement to advance our mission. Uh, and the national has their programs to do that. The chapters have their programs to do that. So if a dollar goes to research, it's not going to the alleviation of pain and suffering. It's not going to services. That's what we used to say. Okay. Uh, we've changed what we say about that now uh, because we uh, incentivized chapters to raise money for research. Could you talk a little bit about your research, uh, the incentives that you've, that you've built in? The revenue sharing policy uh, in our association is that chapters pay a percentage of gross income to the National Association. Uh, currently it's 13.6% of the, of the gross essentially. Uh, that changed uh, so that now research gifts, um, chapters can mitigate their revenue sharing obligation by raising money for research. 
So every dollar that we raise for research creates a credit of 46 cents against our revenue sharing obligation. Ah. So we can uh, be enthusiastic and engage donors who want to fund research and not feel like we're spending time on an effort that isn't going to advance the chapter's mission and objectives. So we've, we've built research into an important piece of what the chapter is doing so that we can talk to donors about that in a meaningful, enthusiastic way. And the National Association recognized that on the financial side, they need to make it easy for us to do that. And so this revenue sharing credit uh, helps make that possible. Has it resulted in increased uh, total revenue? Well, the total revenue of the association uh, has gone up, largely driven by the chapters. Mm -hmm. So chapter revenue has been growing over the last several years. Data is another thing that's important to drive decision making. And I haven't seen really the data that talks about how much research money is coming into chapters um, versus other kinds of revenue. But the total pie has been But the has total pie has been growing. Um, I know that from my own experience in managing an organization, um, the meaning of research money is dramatically different than it was six years ago. Uh, and I'm happy about that because it really not just the financial incentive, um, but it really integrates uh, the mission uh, at the chapter level. Well, that was the other thing that I thought very interesting. It integrates the, the mission at the chapter level, but uh, in addition to that, it also facilitates communication. There is more coordination because you're no longer in competition as you approach donors, so you now have a basis for cooperating as you target uh, individual donors. Uh, this, this very simple business act of creating an incentive um, uh, program has, has actually shifts a whole range of behaviors. Absolutely, it, it turns it turns what can be viewed can be viewed from a bottom line point of view as a negative to a positive. It used to be a negative because those dollars pass through us 100 percent. Now it's a positive. We get to keep 46 of them percent of it. Let's shift gears a little bit. It's always fascinating to me how people get involved in a particular area. Uh, how did you come to, to the ALS Association, and um, what was your, uh, your trajectory, your career trajectory, prior to joining the ALS Association? Well, uh, I was recruited to the association. Uh, unlike a lot of people that were on board when I became an executive here, I had no personal connection to the disease. To the, disease. Uh, the history of the association as a grassroots organization, you have a lot of chapters being formed by volunteers, family members, a lot of executives that have personal experience. That has changed over time. Uh, the board of my chapter at the time um, went through a small strategic planning process with a recruiter to really determine where did they want the organization to go and define the, the uh, profile of the person they needed to take them there. And my track record as an organization executive is really in growing uh, organizations, taking them from a, a, a less mature stage of, of uh, organizational growth to a more mature stage, both in terms of fundraising, in terms of the role of the board and leadership development, and having a professional service uh, infrastructure in place. And so I was recruited into that, uh, that position by this board that made a deliberate decision that they needed to change the direction of the organization and they needed to bring in a professional who could do that. Where were you uh, before? So um, I've been managing nonprofit social service organizations for the past 30 years. Uh, and uh, I've covered a wide range of issues. Uh, unlike some executives where they start in a focus area, mm -hmm. child abuse, teen pregnancy, mental health, um, and that's where they, 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 uh, they stay. Um, I've been in uh, community service organizations, youth serving organizations, dealing with uh, recreation, from recreational programs to high risk youth, dealing from the frail elderly to the mental health of uh, incarcerated felons. Um, so uh, my background is not in business, uh, it's in social work. So my management is informed by program development, by understanding the purpose and function of the organization and creating a structure 
to support its advancement. So you view yourself as, from a professional perspective as a professional nonprofit manager. Correct. And, and executive. Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of, uh, uh, I'm not sure the exa analogy exactly works, but um, uh, uh, my, I adopt the passion and the mission of the organization. It's always, the, the, the constant is social service, community development. That's, that's the common theme throughout all of it. So it's the thing that distinguishes you from a characterization of a hired gun. Yes, because uh, it matters to me, the mission of the organization. Uh, and so uh, if I can embrace the mission of the organization, connect its value to the fabric of the community, and see uh, the role that the organization plays in the community, then I develop a vision for what that organization can become and set about to make it happen. How important is the interaction with the board um, as you decide um, whether an organization is an organization where you'd like to bet a portion of your career? It's critical because nonprofits rely on boards for ultimately uh, agreeing to the strategic direction of the organization. So without the board really buying in, it's very hard to go anywhere. If the board hasn't bought in, it's going to be very hard to raise any money to get you there. So the board is critical, and so it becomes a very important dialogue as part of the interview process. Sometimes I think boards are interviewing executives to see if they want to hire them. Well, the smart executive is going to be interviewing the board uh, to see if, if they want to go there. And uh, I can remember when I came to the, the ALS Association, uh, I started asking some hard questions uh, of the association. And I had questions for the CEO of the National Association. I had questions for the board chair and the board members who were interviewing me at different times. Um, I actually read the bylaws uh, of the organization and, and its contract with the National, their charter, uh, and had questions about that. And uh, uh, I can remember the, the National CEO calling the board chair and saying, you know, this guy's asking a lot of, uh, a lot of challenging questions. Are you sure, you know, that's what you want? And he, his response was, that confirms to me that's what we want. Um, so it can advance the relationship very early on, and it can set the stage for what's going to happen next. Because if you're going to ask tough questions before you start, it means they should expect tough questions while you're there. Your relationship with staff is also of, uh, of great interest. There is a sense sometimes that I've heard, which I found not to be true, that uh, nonprofit organizations are reluctant to uh, make hard staff decisions. Um, I find that not to be uh, the case, but what is your experience? S staff uh, alignment with the vision and mission of the organization is critical. Staff understanding their role in executing their job function in support of that is critical. And not just understanding the role their job plays, but the interaction between their job and all the other jobs in the organization. It's more like pieces of a puzzle that have to come together. And if you end up with a puzzle piece that doesn't fit, the puzzle doesn't work. And organizations can't revolve themselves around misshapen puzzle pieces. Or around staff needs. It's exactly. a, a mission-driven organization. Well, so there's where the, the tension becomes, because no organization is in is in business to take care of staff. Right. And uh, every staff person needs to understand that. But every staff person also has a right to uh, be respected. As every staff person needs to be respected. And how the organization takes care of its staff has a lot to do with staff retention and staff recruitment. Right. So if you want to recruit the best people and keep the best people, then you're going to want to create incentives for them to stay. Um, so that's really where the intersection between what staff need and what the organization needs 
there's an understanding that you have to come to, that you need to invest in staff. You need to invest in their training. You need to invest in their benefits and all the things that staff value. And you need to give them a meaningful purpose because their role in the organization and their work in the organization shouldn't just be fulfilling the needs of the organization. The highly productive people are people who are working in a role that not just fulfills the needs of the organization, but is an extension of themselves. Right. So if you can create that match between the interests and ambition of an employee and the interests and ambition of the organization and create a fit in the job, then you have, a, you have the best opportunity for a highly impactful organization. Well, Fred, this has been really informative. And thank you so much for dedicating your career to the community. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.